Good morning out there. Uh, welcome again to the uh, Pineland Speaker Series. It's a beautiful first day of October. Uh, I was out in the woods this week already a couple days and the colors are really starting to pop. So uh, if you got some free time, this is a beautiful time to get out and check the Pine Barrens. Uh, we're very fortunate today. We have uh, John Volpa. John is the um, Director of Education for Pinelands Adventures. I've known and worked with John for a long time. He's a, a former school teacher and has always been a great resource uh, to the Pinelands Commission with our education programs. And uh, today, John is gonna talk about John McPhee's book, The Pine Barrens. It's called Serendipity. And uh, with that, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to John and uh, sit back and enjoy the story. Thank you very much, Joel, and welcome and good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Mr. McPhee for allowing Pinelands Preservation Alliance and Pinelands Adventures to use his name for, um, this is a tour that we use at Pinelands Adventures. And uh, Carlton Montgomery, PPA's executive director, hatched this idea uh, years ago and received Mr. McPhee's permission to use his name. Also, thanks to Mr. McPhee for writing the book. Um, it inspired very specific social action during those early days of the modern environmental movement when so much progress was being made. The establishment of the EPA, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, uh, the Endangered Species Act. So many steps forward were made in the early 1970s and it would seem that the uh, very first Earth Day 50 years ago truly resonated with America at that time. So let's take a look at the impact of a writer who inspired positive social change, uh, ecological change, and uh, join, he joins the long list of uh, writers such as Humboldt, Dickens, Sinclair, and Carson. So our story begins in an unlikely place. Found in Morris County, the Great Swamp lies within a glacial depression left from the last Great Ice Age. It's a key migration link for hundreds of species of birds following the Atlantic flyway to and from the tundra. Now, some of you may know these two places in the pines, Spring Hill Pygmy Pine Plains are adjacent to Lake Oswego in a former reservoir near Cranberry Bogs. And the photographer Bob Birdsall is one of many locals that you may be familiar with. So what does the Great Swamp have in common with the Pygmy Pine Plains and, the, um, and Lake Oswego? Supersonic flight was going to be the wave of the future in the late 50s. Now the Concorde required seven mile long runways and quick access over open ocean so the sonic boom it would create would not disturb humans. The first planned location was the Great Swamp. In the 1950s, most people looked at swamps with disdain and disgust. They were worthless, mosquito infested. Well, if one only sees the value in thing, of things in dollars and cents, uh, that, then it was worthless. But for the local people, they recognized the ecological value of the swamp. They valued the diversity of life that it supported and the water that perked into the ground feeding nearby wells. So they fought big business and the land planners for five years, and they won. In 1964, President Johnson signed the Wilderness Act and the swamp became the National Wildlife Refuge that it is today. So the planners look at the Pine Barrens thinking, eh, it's just a bunch of sand, scraggly little pine trees, let's bulldoze it and make the jet port there. And they planned for not only the jet port, which would have been 49 square miles of concrete and asphalt, also plopping down a city of a quarter million people called New City. Well, John McPhee was born and raised in Princeton in between the Highlands and the Pinelands. And he was surely aware of this jet port controversy and it piqued his interest as a young writer. Of course, People who care about the pines and valued it, and they saw more than just worthless sand and pine trees. And people across America were beginning to awaken to the first rule of ecology that everything is connected to everything else. 
And as Rachel Carson made clear in her groundbreaking book, Silent Spring, what we spray upon the soil comes back to haunt our health and the health of wildlife. And John McPhee opened many eyes to this special and ecologically valued, e valued ecosystem. Now, interestingly, the people who fought <clears throat> the Great Swamp went on to form NJCF. And many of the Pine Barrens conservationists who fought the jet port went on to form PPA in 1989. Well, protests by the local citizens helped stop the jet port effort but what really stopped it was the discovery made by the US Geologic Survey in 1966. They drove test wells into the piney sands and discovered that it contained a huge amount of water. And that aquifer is celebrated, and the main reason why the Pinelands exist today, celebrated in a recent series produced by Pinelands Preservation Alliance called Save the Source, and maybe you've seen one of these cards. I'll see if I can hold it up to the screen so you can read it. It's the water we drink. You gotta love the aquifer. So this is really what killed the jet port concept. Today, these two beautiful regions in the Northwest and the Southeast parts of New Jersey have been preserved so their waters remain protected to benefit the people of New Jersey now and in the future. The New Jersey Highlands provide nearly two thirds of New Jersey population, 5.4 million people with clean drinking water and over a million people depend upon the water of the Pinelands National Reserve. So as soon as we speak about water, uh, we must look at uh, the interconnectedness of life on earth, uh, basic human needs for food, water, shelter, space, innately drive us for initiative individual survival. But as we quickly approach a population of 8 billion, the following key environmental issues spotlight our need to find solutions to growing needs. Many of the baby boomers will remember the dead rivers such as the Delaware and dead lakes such as the Lake Erie. Um, many will remember when the Cayuga River in Ohio caught fire. Now it's hard to wrap your head around an idea that uh, a river could catch fire. Um, and many people from that era uh, who lived in that era will remember a popular song made uh, by a group named Spirit with the hook, it's nature's way of telling you something's wrong. Well, while that was happening, as the quote here from McPhee's book reads, luckily, the piney rivers continued to flow cleanly. Every culture has words for water. Here are just a few samples. And by now you may have recognized an important theme for this presentation. Perhaps my t-shirt gave it away. Um, but Mr. McFree read, let the reader know in chapter one, when we meet Fred Brown, that this is the main issue. That quote from Fred Brown identifies the key natural resource of the Pine Barrens and the key to its unique ecology. Having decided to investigate the pines, which was easy driving distance from Princeton, <clears throat> Mr. McPhee had the good fortune to meet Fred Brown. And it was the need for water on a very hot summer day that drew John to Fred's house upon seeing a hand pump in front of Fred's house. <clears throat> now the eight old automobiles, two on their side, one upside down, uh, were observations that did not give him pause, but he knocked on the door, he was quickly invited inside. And instantly, Fred became John's mentor and guide to the Pine Barrens, starting his journey right there in Hogwalla. And it was the basic need for water that led John like a divining rod to Fred. The PRM is the oldest and deepest aquifer, which also means it's not being easily replenished. The municipal water systems of west of the Pines, Camden and Gloucester counties are drawing on the PRM. <clears throat> now I'm gonna add uh, to this diagram with a, a model 
But again, um, so it is the water we drink. So I'm gonna see if I do a little model here. Um, essentially, having taught in the classroom for many years, um, I got this idea from the uh, chief scientist at uh, Pinelands Commission, uh, Bob Zampella. And he said, he used to describe the aquifer as a jar of marbles. So it's like, well, let me get a jar of marbles. So I get a jar of marbles to show the kids and say, okay, here's all the sand. At the bottom of that sand is a layer of clay. So here's that clay. And because the sand is so porous, when it rains, the water quickly perks down through, hopefully you can see that, the water quickly perks down through the sand, stops when it hits the clay, fills up the spaces between the sand, and clings to each layer of sand. This holds 17 trillion gallons of water. And so in the Pine Barrens, for people who live there, uh, which is over a million people, we'll add a little bit more water. When someone's home is built, they simply hire someone to drive a pipe. So we'll use our down into those sands. And that's how people get their drinking water. And so this unconfined aquifer is very close to the surface in many places. So we'll move to chapter two of McPhee's book. We're gonna go back in time, um, looking at some of the vanished towns. Sam, this is a picture of Samuel Richards' summer mansion, which was built in 1826 at Atsine. And over 400 people lived at Atsine Village during his 20, 20 plus years there. Now, of course, before those towns, the Pines and beyond were home to the indigenous population and life of the Lene Lenape, a matriarchal uh, tribe was probably quite wonderful uh, until 1609 when the Dutch showed up and claimed the land as theirs. Conquest, exploitation, murder. It's easy if, you, uh, if one's mind is uh, a certain moves to a certain amount of uh, dehumanization by othering. And uh, that's basically what the Dutch did. They um, moved more into the Hudson River Valley, um, northern New Jersey and New York. And things didn't go well. Um, there were three wars. The first two, the Pig War and the Whiskey War, uh, the Dutch beat up mercilessly um, on the Lenny Lenape. Uh, the Massacre at Hoboken was quite horrible. And then the last one, the Peachtree War, was uh, one of revenge in the 1650s, which led to the um, downfall of the Dutch, who were then defeated by the English, and New Jersey was claimed by the English at that point in time. When the English took over, <clears throat> the what was New Jersey, uh, King Charles, Charles gave the land to uh, the Duke of York, who divided it between two friends. Uh, Lord Berkeley got West Jersey, and um, Mr. Carteret got East Jersey. <clears throat> I like to think of it as North Jersey and South Jersey. Uh, East Jersey is basically where the Dutch were, and the only settlement in West Jersey that was really successful were by Swedes and Finns in what is now basically um, Wilmington, Delaware area. Uh, they were the first Europeans to, to settle in the Delaware Valley successfully. They collaborate, collaborated politically, socially, and eco economically with the Lenny Lenape. Um, they even intermarried. They got along incredibly well with the local people. And there was never any war between the Swedes and the Finns and the Lenny Lenape in West Jersey. Those positive relationships helped pave the way for uh, the Quakers and acting upon, um, so William Penn was able to utilize the Swedes for um, introductions to the Lenny Lenape 
And when he arrived in 1681, he made it clear that the Quaker people also wanted to live in peace with the Lenni Lenape. And as a result, um, there was mutual respect between the two cultures, no war. Uh, but unfortunately, as more Quakers moved in, uh, starting right here in Evesham Township in 1677, by the 1680s, smallpox arrived too. And it decimated the Native American tribes. 90% <clears throat> of the uh, population, it's believed, died off. But in the meantime, uh, things still continued to be have positive relationships. Some of you may be familiar with the name of Chief Akinikin, um, whom um, Camp Akinikin, uh, now YMCA Camp in the Pines, uh, was uh, named after. So, <clears throat> as the uh, Quakers moved in, most were going to be farmers. And after purchasing the land from the Lenni Lenape, uh, they found the soils of the intercoastal plain to be very good. And as they got to the pines, uh, they realized that the sandy low nutrient and very acidic soil was not very good for uh, growing vegetable crops. Hence, they called it the barrens. To give you an idea of how poorly they thought of it, I found this map from 1776. And the three words at the bottom, which are highlighted are sandy barren deserts. And so it gives you an idea of really what they thought of this area. By 1758, the due to disease, the Lenni Lenape's population continued to drop. And so they asked preacher John Brainerd to help them get a piece of land that would definitely be just for them. And um, this is the first Native American reservation in the United States. Um, they um, lived there uh, not well. Once John Brainerd left, um, the sawmill and the grist mill just running a business was not within um, the native uh, skill set and um, things didn't go well. And then the tribe was invited by related tribe to move to upstate New York. And many of them, most of them moved at that time. So this early period, uh, this is a picture, an aerial photograph of Atsine Lake for the people who know the area. Uh, the road running left to right is Route 206. The road running this way is uh, Atsine Road, which turns into Quaker Bridge Road. And this is where um, Atsine Furnace would begin. Um, Atsine Lake, as you can see, is squared off at the end. And this, there are no natural lakes in the Pine Barrens. They're all human made. And here, the Mullica River was dammed up, forming that um, squared off end. And that was for water power, which would fuel the iron industry. Started by Charles Reed in 16, 1765. Um, essentially, uh, we have the dam, the water flows through a raceway and turns the water wheel, which you see there. Above the water wheel are two bellows that are working simultaneously, literally blasting cold air. You can see a pipe into the bottom of the furnace. There's a walkway at the top where all the ingredients are added into the furnace. And the first ingredient that would be added in would be the fuel and the iron industry is based upon the fact that in the Pine Barrens rivers, there were literally tons of this stuff. I'll try and hold it up so you can see it. One example of what we call bog iron. It only has about 45% iron. It's not very pure. There are lots of, uh, lots of sand and other impurities in it, but there was so much of it that it was able to be processed. And the processing involved a lot of heat uh, the iron melts out at about 2,800 degrees. So this is when the clear cutting of the um, pines begins and that's to form charcoal. Charcoal can reach a temperature of 2,500 degrees. Skilled workers called colliers made what you see on the left, which is called a collier's mound. It's stacked uh, timber 
which is then uh, lit on fire. It's covered with sand and turf, so it burns very slowly. It takes about 10 days and forms charcoal at the end of that time. Concentrated carbon, it can be um, get to 2,500 degrees. So this was the first ingredient added into the furnace. Uh, about two, two and a half tons of charcoal would be added. Then on top of that, a ton of bog iron and then a few wheelbarrows filled with clamshells and oyster shells, which is calcium carbonate, which would be used to help the um, impurities adhere to it and that would be drawn off. The products that were made from the molten iron would be things that you see here, kettles, pots, pans, but most importantly during the American Revolution, cannonball. And Batstow was the first, but um, Mr. Reed uh, made the business person's mistake of expanding too fast too soon, and he sold Batstow very early on, and he went bankrupt. Now, the industry would continue for over 100 years, um, and during that time, there'd be 30 different forges and furnaces in the Pine Barrens, each one using approximately 1,000 acres of woodland a year, and the consequence is that the Pine Barrens was essentially clear-cut three times. So um, the um, Batstow producing cannonball was incredibly important to the um, revolution. And when Mr. Reed sold it to, um, he sold it to a man named John Cox. I'm just going to read a quick quote from Mr. McPhee's book on page 28 um, about this deal. Quote, in 1770, a Philadelphian named John Cox bought Batstow for 2,350 pounds. Cox was a member of the first committee of correspondence and a, midi, and a member of the committee council of safety. With the coming of war, he became a Lieutenant Colonel and eventually the assistant quartermaster general of the Continental Armies. His iron works at Batstow flourished on war contracts from the Quartermaster Corps, and in 1778, Cox sold Batstow for 40,000 pounds, a capital gain of about 1,600%. So if you've ever heard the term, the military industrial complex, it started early on, uh, before we were even really a full-fledged country. Um, Harrisville is another example of, of an industry that developed in the Pine Barrens utilizing the water power of the many streams. Uh, this is built along the Wading River. Uh, the earliest paper mill was built in the 1830s at Harrisville. They used rags, uh, rope, and salt hay to make a uh, heavy butcher, butcher block type of paper. Martha's Furnace, and much of what we know about Martha's Furnace uh, comes from uh, the storekeeper, Caleb Earl, who kept a diary. And uh, some of his quotes, which are in um, Mr. McPhee's book, illustrate that there were definitely some issues with um, drinking in the area um, to the point that uh, many iron masters would not sell uh, alcohol at the company store. But going back to the fact that water makes great beer. Our next card from PPA and Save the Source is, great water makes great beer. <clears throat> so due to deforestation and over exploitation of materials such as the bog iron, um, basically the bog iron ran out by the 1840s, 1850s, and the discovery of a better grade of coal are a better grade of iron and uh, anthracite coal in Eastern Pennsylvania brought everyone uh, moving. Many people moved out of the area, turning these, uh, hence the vanished villages and ghost towns of the Pines. Uh, since most people did not own their own homes, they were company owned homes, they simply moved. Many go into Eastern Pennsylvania to work in the coal mines and in that area. So um, many of those 
Ghost towns are described in Barbara Solom's book, uh, Ghost Towns and other, other Quirky Places in the Pine Barrens. So the people who remain um, became known as Pineys. And to be a Piney uh, from that hundred years be between the demise of the iron industry in the 1960s basically meant living off the land. And that means working the cycle. Uh, during the summer, that would be raking sphagnum moss, uh, in the fall, being a hunting guide, uh, winter, uh, making uh, mountain laurel garland, uh, and in the summer, uh, trapping. And so uh, it wasn't until after Mr. McPhee's book that was published that you began to see bumper stickers like this, um, because this was, uh, well, we'll get to that in a second, why these bumper stickers started showing up in the late 60s. Basically, John McPhee described the Piney lifestyle with respect for them and their creative and resourceful skill sets. And it wasn't until 68 that one saw these uh, bumper stickers as Piney people began to rediscover uh, their pride. Uh, because 60 years before, that had been stripped away from them. At the turn of the century, a twisting of Darwin's theory of evolution had occurred, which is now referred to many times as social Darwinism. And the piney people were victimized and stigmatized by it. And that lasted until Mr. McPhee's book. Um, essentially, eugenics theory states that some people are better than others and more advanced, and many of whom uh, the inferior people are, were given terms such as feeble-minded, morons, uh, which were educational terms until the 1960s. Um, Dr. Goddard um, had a protege named Ms. Kite who uh, traveled among the Piney people and she constructed a genealogy report uh, based upon some interviews and really provided a very distorted view of the Piney people. And Mr. McPhee writes of this in his book. I'm going to do a read a quick quote uh, from his book on page 52. Um, this is from 1913. It reads, Miss Kite's report about the Pineys was made public. Newspapers printed excerpts from it. All over the state, people became alarmed about conditions in the Pine Barrens, a region most people had never heard of. James Fielder, the governor of New Jersey, traveled to the Pines, returned to Trenton, and sought to increase his political momentum by recommending to the legislature that the Pine Barrens be somehow segregated from the rest of the state of New Jersey in the interest of the health and safety of the people at large. Quote, I've been shocked at the conditions I found. He said, evidently these people are a serious menace to the state of New Jersey because they produce so many persons that inevitably become public charges. They have inbred and led lawless and scandalous lives until they have become a race of imbeciles, criminals, and defectives. Now I looked up the governor's speech and here are the next two sentences which Mr. McPhee omitted. Quote, the state must segregate them, that is certain. I think it may be necessary to sterilize some of them, unquote. This was part of the eugenics philosophy. And to our benefit, 1913, New Jersey State Supreme Court ruled that no one was going to be sterilized against their will in the state of New Jersey. Well, Mr. Goddard went on to create this fantastical story, which he made up, uh, called the Calacac family, about Pineys. And <clears throat> his book, along with many others, espousing eugenics philosophy, um, basically, here's the, uh, the gist of his story. Martin Kalakak, returning from the, Civil, uh, the American Revolution, has a dalliance with a piney wench, and all their offspring are horrible, inbred, demented people. He leaves her, marries a good Quaker woman, and all of their offspring are brilliant 
doctors, lawyers, college uh, presidents, completely fiction. Well, this book is very popular and Goddard's book, along with many others espousing eugenics philosophy were translated into German and of course read by Adolf Hitler. And we all know how he embraced that philosophy. It became the foundation of the master race leading to the Holocaust. So <clears throat> this picture that I have, this actually came, this was in a general psychology book from 1955. So it's unfortunate the eugenics theory was still being taught at that time. And I believe it still seems to be a cornerstone of the racism that we're seeing today. And the Piney people definitely carried this stigma, to stigma for many years. So going back to chat, go, moving on to chapter four, culture is a human response to the environment. And despite being victimized by eugenics philosophy, the Piney people have created their own unique culture, uh, best expressed in music, legends and lore, uh, such as Sammy Guyverson's Guy fine fiddling to escape the devil, of course, the Jersey devil. And um, this is, if you ever get a chance to go to Albert Hall, uh, it's a cornerstone of Piney music. Chatsworth has adopted the title of chapter five as its town slogan. And this is where uh, John would get to know some of the locals at Busby's store. Um, and unfortunately, um, <clears throat> it was um, it's been gone out of business, but it maintained as uh, Busby's for um, many, many years. Nearby in Whitesbog, Chatsworth is also the center of, a cran of cranberry country and Whitesbog is nearby. And cranberries are native to the Pine Barrens. And after the demise of the iron industries, um, they proliferated because the trees were gone and the edges of the rivers and streams had been opened up. So the native cranberry benefited from this new um, environment and they were proliferating everywhere on their own. People began to cultivate them. And one of the people who really figured out how to turn them into a viable crop was J.J. White. And he was a very early innovator. Now, the folks that you see here are Italian immigrants and they are conducting what is called the dry harvest. And basically that means whole families going out, hands and knees, picking berries one at a time and then taking them to be uh, counted and get your ticket or chit that showed that you had come, how many uh, baskets you had filled. Well, nowadays we have the wet harvest and most growers belong to Ocean Sprays Co-op, um, which is many families throughout the United States. And of course, in saving the source, we have Growing with the flow, a picture of cranberry harvest. The wet harvest was um, produced, was a dis first innovated here in the Pine Barrens. Now, J.J. White's daughter, so I had to check that. Joel has a we told me he would text me if there was an issue. So I thought I had, we had an issue. So excuse me. Nope, we're good. All right. So <clears throat> J.J. White's daughter, Elizabeth, loved everything about agriculture. And she <clears throat> um, read an article by a, uh, someone in uh, United States Agricultural um, Journals, um, Mr. Co Dr. Coville, who recognized the cranberries grow very well in acid soils. Elizabeth said to her father, we have acid soils. We have the local huckleberry. Why don't we invite Dr. Coville to Whitesbog and see what we can do as far as turning this into a viable crop. And this is where they started their experiments. And to get it start, to get their ideas started, they employed the pineys to tap tapped into their knowledge. So this is a facsimile 
of <clears throat> Ms. White's advertisement to the Piney saying that she will pay up to $3. This is in 1912. $3 is a lot of money. Asking Pineys to go out and identify, tag what was then called the Huckleberry uh, with large berries. And then she and Dr. Coville would go out and supervise its um, transfer and transplant it back at White's Bog. And they got a few dozen tr uh, shrubs. And from those, they were able to create the modern blueberry industry. And Ms. White gets credit for that. So again, we celebrate watering the garden state, growing with our cranberries. So some of you may recognize this person. Um, his name is Joseph White and, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Joseph Wharton. And uh, after the cranberry took off, cranberry uh, industry took off, so did land speculation. Many people bought properties in the pines, but the recession of 1874 scared many away. So recognizing the value of the water of the Pine Barrens, that it was the water, Mr. Wharton stepped in and began to purchase old iron and glass furnaces, industry sites, and he used straw buyers to quietly accumulate almost 100,000 continuous acres of wetland because he saw the value, which is the water. And here was his plan. He was gonna build dams and canals and get the water flowing west and then sell that water to Philadelphia. Great plan, um, but, and here's a picture of his, or a diagram of his engineering plan. Interestingly, so the, imagine the water flowing west towards Philadelphia, furthest west, those bogs or those reservoirs, some of them are the Black Run Preserve here in Evesham Township. So this is huge serendipity that Mr. Wharton did this. He consolidated all these important wetlands. Well, he didn't get permission from the New Jersey legislature to do this, so his plan was thwarted. And so the um, going back, sorry, go back a step. So um, <clears throat> when the law prevented him from sending the water to Philadelphia, he tried being a gentleman farmer. He, uh, you'll see his mansion at Batstow. He tried growing uh, sugar beets and peanuts in the pines and raising cattle. Uh, that didn't work. He died in 1909 and his heirs weren't interested in the pines, it seems and they sold the Wharton tract as it was known to the state in 1955, which was a major serendipity for us because the Wharton State Forest makes up a, the main preservation area of the Pinelands National Reserve. Moving to chapter six, Mr. McPhee returned to Chatsworth to focus upon three major events, the 1954 fire Italian royalty living in the Pines and Mexico's Lindbergh. So many of you who know the Pines have probably seen the Carranza Memorial. Uh, he was a friend of Lindbergh, conducted some air shows with him and on a return flight, trying to make a nonstop flight from New York City to Mexico in July of 1928, <clears throat> he unfortunately crashed and burned in the Pines. And I'm gonna read a quick excerpt because um, Fred Brown tells this part of the story to John and he quotes Fred. So on page 106, Mr. McPhee writes, Fred walked to a large pine that had been left standing in the cleared area and he paced out four yards from the tree. Quote, Carranza's wing fell 300 yards up that way, he said, gesturing to the east. The rest of the plane hit this tree and right here is where his head was. There wasn't no blood where he laid. What do you suppose? He just bled inside? There was no blood. He had a flashlight still in his hand, an ordinary nickel flashlight, no more than a two cell, unquote. 
<clears throat> Carranza's widow visited Chatsworth some years after her husband's death. She wore a purple blouse and a purple skirt and protruding from her sandals were purple toenails. Carranza's sister came, also came and she flew over the monument and scattered roses from the air. So that monument is uh, one of the special places of the pines um, and there's a celebration held every July uh, with the VFW, uh, United States Consulate, Mexican Consulate. And if you check the schedule, I don't know if we, were, they, I don't think they had it last July, but uh, hopefully in the future um, after COVID is uh, under control and or passes, we have a vaccine, we'll be able to participate in seeing that. <clears throat> the Pine Barrens is a fire prone ecosystem. And living there means that you have to learn how to deal with it. And that's what Pine Barrens residents do. <clears throat> Pine Barrens is a very harsh environment, um, very dry because of the sandy soil, um, very acidic. And so everything is adapted to it. And if it wasn't for pines or for, for fire, it would be the Oak Barrens. And so the pitch pine is extremely well adapted to uh, this environment. So many pineys are integral members of the New Jersey Forest Fire Service, staffing the fire towers and fighting the fires. Unfortunately, over 45% of the fires are caused by arson. <clears throat> From an ecosystem perspective, fire is an important factor uh, for many plant and bird species, such as the pine warbler. Respect for the environment and things in it is part, truly part of the piney spirit. Um, there are many special plants and animals in the pines, and the, the fox that's being discussed here is the gray fox. So there's a red fox and gray fox. Uh, the gray fox can climb a tree. So uh, take a look at some other unique Pine Barrens species. So one of the last wildflowers to bloom, which is happening right now, um, is the Pine Barrens gentian. Uh, we just reviewed examples of <clears throat> each animal class and its ancestors that evolved through time in vertebrates, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, flowering plants. All but one of those that you just saw was an example of a Pine Barrens threatened or endangered species. Which takes us to the sad news that um, many scientists have recognized that we are, we humans are causing what is known as the sixth extinction. There have been five mass extinctions in geologic time and naturally caused generally global climate change. And now we are responsible for the demise of so many species on our planet. We are losing huge amounts of diversity. All right, so try not to get too bummed out. In the last chapter of Mr. McPhee's book, he saw how the development was moving west from the shore and east from Philadelphia. And Mr. McPhee ends his book on a very pessimistic note, which is quoted here. <clears throat> well, John McPhee's book got the attention of Brendan Byrne. And, but the first thing that really struck Brendan Byrne uh, about the book was the way that John McPhee wrote about the Pineys because Brendan Byrne knew the backstory of how they had been abused by the eugenics movement. And I found a quote from the governor that reads, John didn't find the Pineys he met to be lazy or degenerate, but he described their life with respect. So the book got his attention and this quote in particular, Brennan Byrne took as a challenge, and he vowed that he was going to be the man to do something about the Pine Barrens. Uh, last year, I had the 
good fortune to meet um, Governor Brendan Burns' son. And he said his father was not an outdoorsman, but he took it upon himself to canoe and hike in the Pine Barrens because he really wanted to learn about this unique ecosystem. And he was completely enthralled with it and recognized its value. And so the biggest piece of serendipity occurred after a tremendous fight, if you can imagine, the people that had to be convinced to, to vote for such a law, but lucky for us, he did. And against tremendous odds, the governor's vision became a reality and the Pinelands National Reserve became our first reserve. It's the largest wilderness on the East Coast between Boston and Washington, DC. And so we have the map behind us. And so <clears throat> interestingly, you may see, so here's Cape May, here's Atlantic City, and then Philadelphia. Um, notice this section is not Pine Barrens. It's, well, politics. Um, this area was carved out. It said that a certain senator got his thumb and forefinger in there and made sure that development was not gonna be stopped in his neck of the woods, which was Atlantic City, because Atlantic City had just gotten gambling approved in the 70s and it was gonna boom along. So essentially the colors represent the idea of putting, allowing development on the outside periphery and keeping the interior as pristine as possible. Uh, development of the comprehensive management plan overseen by the Pylands Commission helps maintain uh, that our Pylands National Reserve. And so uh, 1.1 million acres, largest wilderness on the East Coast. And so it's thriving and an aquifer flows through it. And there's our emblematic symbol of the Pine Barrens, the Pine Barrens tree frog. The modern environmental movement has really evolved to recognize global issues that face humanity's ability to survive and what we can do to ensure that future generations have what they need to survive and addressing the concept of uh, its sustainability. And so hopefully uh, what you're also seeing here, Pinelands Preservation Alliance puts out a state of the Pinelands report every year and evaluates who's doing their best to help or hurt the pines. Again, it's all about the water and again, from the barren to the bay, an aquifer flows through it. And many times people don't think about how all the tourism of the pine of the Jersey Shore is related to clean water. And also the fact that it's a key stopover point for the Atlantic Flyway. So here we have red knots who are an, an endangered species feasting on horseshoe crab eggs, which have clean water to along the Delaware Bay shore, which helps feed those birds when the horseshoe crabs lay their green eggs in May. So priming the bay for little seafood for us and for the birds and other wildlife. And so when you think about go to the Jersey Shore and you get to enjoy all the water sports of being in the bay and being on the beach, being able to fish, being able to crab. All that clean estuary water is there because that water is flowing out of the Pine Barrens and the Pinelands National Reserve. It's so important that our economy, the ecotourism is so dependent upon that clean water. So Pinelands Preservation Alliance and Pinelands Adventures have really been working to uh, educate people about the pines and give them positive experiences of ecotourism in the pines. And so, yes, paddling the piney rivers. And of course, it's the aquifer that 
floats our boats. Ah, uh, yes, pipeline threats to the Pine Barrens, which PPA and other groups have focused on trying to stop. And green infrastructure, if you're not aware of rain gardens, these are more ways to work sustainably to keep water from picking up rainwater that lands on properties, from picking up uh, pollutants on the street and then running off into streams, keeping that water on the uh, land. And so there. As an educator, this is a quote that's inspired me over the years because of uh, it speaks about vision. And I like to say, add the phrase, involve the people, because that's what sustainability movement is about. So if you have questions, I don't, um, you can follow these directions. And I guess Joel's going to join me now. All right. Thanks a lot, John. That was a really uh, great program, man. You covered a lot of material, really tied a lot of those loose ends and uh, really bring it all together and showed the importance of, uh, you know, how someone can make a difference and how McPhee's writing really, uh, you know, brought the uh, forces to bear and, and helped preserve and uh, save the Pinelands for us all. Yeah, I think we're just incredibly lucky that um, he drew so much attention to the Pine Barrens at that time and uh, helped galvanize the um, focus upon the Pine Barrens that eventually obviously inspired Governor Brendan Byrne to do what he did. And there's just so much serendipity going back to uh, the fact that Joseph Wharton did what he did. I mean, that um, almost 100,000 acres that he put together essentially makes up the preservation area of the, uh, the most pristine area of the Pine Barrens. So there's just so much serendipity that plays into it. But really, it was uh, the hero of our story. Really, is Governor Brendan Byrne. But John McPhee did what great writers do: inspired other people to take action. And so many positive things have come together uh, that we have this wonderful playground, but also the aquifer, the water that we are using to drink and uh, sustain ourselves. So it's uh, we're lucky. Yeah, you know, you know, I agree. It's it's really all about the water. The water is, you know, it's been said many times. Is the is the lifeblood of the Pine Barrens, the Pine Lands, and is really the the foundational piece that's uh, enabled it all. And uh, it's just really neat to you know look through history and see those connections and how the momentum kind of built and uh, led to you know the pre preservation of the Pine Lands as we see it today. Um, which in today's day and age may be very difficult. You know, it might not have been as easy to get those uh, laws enacted in today's day and age that were enacted, you know, <laughs> particularly in the, the mid to the late 1970s. Oh, uh, you're definitely right about that. <laughs> it seems like it's hard to get anyone to agree upon anything these days. Uh, but the 70s really were uh, a watershed moment for um, America. I mean, you know, if you grew up in that era, you just remember how it, the rivers were just a mess. I mean, and, and the lakes and pollution and litter and just, you know, the idea that, you know, just go dump it out in the woods. Uh, the need for um, the Superfund site cleanups because there were so many what became known as Superfund sites that people were just dumping things on the land. People just weren't thinking about uh, what the end result was upon the quality of life for all living things, including ourselves. And everything's connected. Yep. That's the first rule of ecology. Yeah, that, that's true. You know, like I said, we, the plants, the animals, we're all part of the same system. And absolutely, that's always good to remind people is everything is connected to everything. And uh, sometimes that gets lost and it's more about the moment or a financial decision. And, uh, you know, you don't really get that full, um, bearing of all the, the weight of the implications of, you know, things like that. So if anybody's out there, here's the number, please call in. We'll be glad to put you through with your question. Um, you know, I'll ask you for the ID number to, to go in as well, and uh, we'll be glad to talk to you. 
you know, when I found that map, that engineering map and started to study it, uh, I was just amazed when I realized that the, what is now the Black Run Preserve um, would have been part of the reservoir system outside of Camden, sending the water onto Philly and Camden. It was just amazed me that, uh, you know, it was in the plan. And uh, more serendipity is the fact that the land that we call the Black Run Preserve uh, now exists. If it wasn't for the Pinelands National Reserve coming into existence, it would have been those cranberry bogs in the Black Run Preserve would have been developed with houses and development and certainly would have had a negative impact upon that environment. Right now, our little Pinelands or our Black Run Preserve is a little island of still pristine pine barrens. Um, the water and the soil are still very acidic. Uh, it's about 95% native, uh, native plants and animals. Um, the water tests at like 4.2 um, on the uh, pH scale. Uh, Pine Barrens water is basically 4.4 to 5.5. Now, as soon as you get a mile away from the, pine, from the Black Run Preserve, pH is up. Uh, Non-native species are in. So uh, the Pinelands National Reserve uh, protected those, that area. So where we are in Evesham is in this Northwest corner right here. And the fact that um, it was, that area was also owned by a local Quaker family or two families, the Evans and the Wills, who were cranberry growers in that area for a hundred years uh, from the middle 1800s to 1965. Um, they sold to the developers who would create King's Grant and King's Grant was supposed to expand into that area but it was stopped because of the laws protecting the water, the aquifer um, in the uh, comprehensive management plan. So uh, again, more serendipity that we have this little corner of Pine Barrens still available to us. Uh, closest piece of intact Pine Barrens uh, ecologically uh, to Philadelphia. All right. Philly's only 15 miles away from Evesham Township. And to get the native plants and animals quality that we have here, you have to go another half hour, uh, you know, 15 miles east, uh, moving into the part of the pines at Atsine and Wharton State Forest. So uh, we're really lucky to have something uh, this close. So lots of serendipity that's uh, brought things together. And with COVID, more and more people have come to realize the importance of uh, outdoor spaces and uh, our need for finding peaceful places where we can relax, exercise, and uh, hopefully share the space with uh, diverse human beings that we can respect one another in these spaces and help make everyone feel welcome so that they can go out and enjoy uh, these public spaces, open spaces, and uh, help improve public health. Uh, being, being able to go out and hike and trail run and mountain bike and do photography, just take a walk, uh, walk with your dog, uh, be with your friends. It improves health at so many different levels, not just physically, but emotionally, socially, spiritually. Uh, these are things that people need. And uh, I just feel fortunate that we have uh, our little corner here in Evesham, but that we have the Pinelands National Reserve uh, that really provides spaces for so many people to enjoy. Uh, I was just down at the shore last week with my wife and you know, we were kayaking on, in clean water. It's just gorgeous, you know, seeing the osprey, uh, various birds, seeing the monarch butterflies migrating. It's all possible because the Pinelands National Reserve has kept those waters clean. And, it's just a tremendous resource. It's funny how New Jersey gets beat up on and, uh, when people who know nothing about it, whereas uh, the Pinelands and the uh, northwest part of our state are absolutely gorgeous. Uh, we have the Appalachian Trail, we have the Highlands. Uh, there's so much. Most people only see what the uh, uh, what is along the turnpike, which is not our, our best point of view.
Yeah, I've, I've uh, had to sell the pine lands to many people in other parts of the country. And I tell them about it and explain to them the water. And, you know, it's like wilderness in your backyard. And they look at me like I'm crazy. They're like, you're talking about New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, 20, 22% of it is in the National Reserve. It's a huge, you know, it's a, a huge part of the state. Um, but like I said, thank it's a, such a great resource, you know, to spend out outdoors and get to really see it all. Uh, that's what I recommend is if you haven't spent a lot of time in the pine lands or pine barrens, get out there and check it out, especially when this fall, uh, fall is a beautiful time. The leaves are changing and, uh, you know, the mosquitoes aren't so bad. The green heads kind of go away. Uh, once there's a frost, you don't got to worry about some of the ticks and the chiggers. And, uh, you know, it's really a magical time to spend time uh, in the woods and the pine barrens uh, in the fall. So uh, if people have a free chance or free opportunity, uh, go for it. Yeah, it is uh, a great time of year. Well, October is Pinelands Month. So we're kicking off Pinelands Month essentially today. Yep. We'll just give it a couple minutes. Usually uh, there is a delay, a 30 second delay, uh, but then it does seem it takes a little while for people to call. So. We'll hang in here for a little bit. Uh, if you have any questions for John, please feel free. The number's on the screen and uh, we'll be here uh, waiting for some input. I got to spend some time uh, over the weekend uh, kayaking on the Wading River and that was a pretty Pretty nice day. The temperature is going to be a little cooler, but I think the fall is one of my best favorite times to kayak as well. Um, you just you got to be dressed a little bit warmer and uh, try not to get your feet so wet when you get in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have you um, paddled the Oswego River recently? Uh, I had not done it yet this year. I did it last fall and uh, it was pretty good last fall, but I haven't made that trip yet this season. Uh, that's usually one, one we do every year and uh, we just haven't got to it yet. Um, so uh, I can't give you any insight to how it is right now. Yeah. Then usually by late summer, early fall, because of the, uh, you know, lack of rain, there are some pretty low spots in there. And I just don't know how clear it is after some of the storms that we've had, we had a tropical, uh, storm come through, I guess, in August, early September. Yep. So, yeah. Uh, part of the challenge is, uh, negotiating the, uh, the downfall um, yep. across the river sometimes. Yeah, you know, you always, when I'm out there kayaking, you always think about the, the poor person who must have went through early that year and, and took out those early trees that kind of cover the way. There's a lot of places you kind of got to duck. And uh, certainly uh, my thanks goes out to whoever is that first person out there who really takes the time to uh, clear some of those uh, rivers and streams because it definitely every winter, uh, even in the springtime, there seems to be a fair amount of trees that come down and uh, it definitely takes somebody to get out there and do a little bit of maintaining uh, to make it safe for everybody else. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a challenge, early spring. Yep. All right. I, I did have the opportunity to kayak on the Batstow this summer, and that was really an enjoyable uh, experience. We went in on Quaker Bridge and went all the way down to uh, Batstow Lake. And, uh, you know, it's a little tighter up there than in some of the other places in the Pines. But, man, it was really uh, uh, kind of a serene, quiet day. And you really feel like you're really kind of uh, about as far in as you can get uh, in, those, uh, in the upper reaches of the Batstow uh, on its way down. Oh, it's true. At Pinelands Adventures, we have so many clients that uh, experience the Batstow and they come back and they say like, it was just so magical because they felt like they were, it, they were, and they felt like they were in the middle of a wilderness and the serenity that just surrounds you, the quiet. And one of the neat things about uh, that river, particularly on a hot summer day, you know, there's a lot of shade and uh, because it's so windy, it's like there's something new around every corner. And uh, it, it really is 
special, especially if you get to see uh, a variety of turtles or birds, uh, you get lucky enough to see some mammals here and there, uh, some reptiles, it's, uh, it's a special place. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I like it. It was early enough in the spring where the flow was still pretty good. So yeah, pushed along pretty well. Uh, but like you're saying, it's very windy. So, you know, you, ha you had to turn and you had to kind of keep on top of things. So it was for uh, someone who's done a lot of kayaking, but, you know, it, it had, had a little bit of a challenge to it. So it was pretty experiencing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, sometimes on the waiting, you just kind of float more than you steer and you're just more of a relaxing, uh, you know, trip. But the, the one of the bats, though, uh, kind of has the best of both worlds. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but um, I have a copy of a 1974 National Geographic that uh, John McPhee wrote uh, articles for National Geographic and a photographer uh, named uh, William Kurtzinger worked with uh, McPhee creating some beautiful photographs. There actually is a photograph of Fred Brown in there. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if you can see him there. And uh, he passed in 75. He's buried in Pleasant Mills uh, Cemetery. Uh, but McPhee was really helping to keep the um, story about the Pine Barrens <clears throat> alive. And uh, there's a picture in here of folks hanging out at Busby's. I don't know if you can see that real well. And yeah. There's a picture of George Albert Fiddler for whom uh, Albert Hall is named. Yeah, yeah, and that, that reminds me when I saw that uh, slide earlier, I do believe this coming weekend, I think maybe on October 4th is gonna be Albert Hall's uh, Jersey Devil show this year. And I think it may be outside on Sunday, um, but yeah, you know, usually they play on Saturday nights. Sometimes they have Sunday yeah. shows, but uh, you know, it's cost $5 and it's a great kind of, step back in time and really shows that thriving Pine Barrens culture. And uh, I always say it's a great uh, date night because uh, you can get a hot dog for like 250, a soda for a dollar. So for, you know, less than 10 bucks, you get a real night out. And uh, usually there's, you know, five, five bands at least that play. And uh, it's just good foot stomping, you know, the typical uh, kind of country bluegrass, but the, the sound of the Pine Barrens for sure. Cool. Wow, so that's Sunday. Yeah, it's uh, the COVID thing has really put its uh, slowed a lot of things down. So hopefully everything goes well yep. with uh, the festival. All right, John. Well, I want to thank you for your time and uh, thanks for your knowledge. And uh, that was really a great presentation. I really enjoyed it myself. And uh, you, I think on that note, we're going to uh, sign off the live broadcast and uh, if anyone has questions, you can always email uh, info at pinelandsnewjersey.gov, and uh, I will forward your question to John. Um, but thanks a lot, John, and see everyone out there. We'll uh, see you next week. We're going to have John back again. We're lucky to have him for two weeks, and he's going to talk about uh, the Still Brothers and uh, tell us some more of the local history and uh, be a, another very interesting program uh, to look forward for next week on October 8th. Great. I'll see you then. All right. Thanks a lot, John. You're welcome. Take care.